Well, good morning, friends. Happy Sunday, fun day. Welcome to South Point Church, where we believe that Jesus is a big deal and that you matter deeply to God. Uh, I just have this feeling today that it's going to be an awesome morning that, you know, whether you're joining us live on a church online platform or YouTube or Facebook, maybe you're watching this back later in the week. Uh, I don't know if you're here in the geographical area of Southern Maryland or if you're watching somewhere around the country or the world. I don't know if you've ever been to church or if you like grew up uh, or were born in a church. I don't know if you think Jesus is everything or you think Jesus is just a nice guy. Um, but here's what I believe. Uh, you're welcome here and that the Spirit of God is with you wherever you are. And, and so uh, you made it through the resistance. You didn't uh, hit snooze. You rolled over. You at least got your phone or device out. And uh, and you are here this morning. Uh, and, and what I believe is that as you show up, God will show up. Uh, and that when, when God shows up, everything changes. Uh, and that's, that's a good thing because I think we'd all agree something has to change, right? I mean, almost everyone I know, myself included, we're just so wound up, it feels like we could explode at any moment. Now, everywhere I look, people, like good, reasonable, rational, capable people, um, are just looking for ways to be offended and hurt. Uh, and, and it's become so toxic that, that I can start a fight with one word. Now, I thought about like throwing up images, but images, uh, you know, can be more divisive. But just a single word can start a fight. And so the beautiful thing about Church Online is that wherever you are this morning, you can shout all you want in your house. You can talk to the people around you. But what you're not going to do is, is talk about it in the chat. We don't want to hear your opinion. I'm not going to give my opinion on these words. My point is only that single words can create such strong feelings in us. And so, again, feel free to say it out loud wherever you are, um, but don't type about it in the chat. Uh, and, and so here are some words that just evoke strong responses from people. You ready? Masks. I'm not going to comment. Just, just masks. Vaccines. Trump, Biden, online. That could be school, could be work, could be church. Everybody's got opinions. Keep them to yourselves. Justice, could be liberty and justice for all, could be Supreme Court justices. Just justice. That word creates strong feelings. Injustice, again, strong emotions, protests, QAnon, and that most divisive of flavors, pumpkin spice, which I know I said I was going to comment, but can we all agree that pumpkin spice is just, it's overrated. It, it just means they added cinnamon. It, it's not that great. We need to move on uh, from, the, from the pumpkin craze. Uh, so if you, we just ran through that word gauntlet and, and you're feeling some kind of way, you're not alone, right? Because, because uh, the words I've heard people describe how they feel lately with all of this going on, uh, the words are, are, are heavy, like not just the COVID-15 heavy, which I'm feeling this week, uh, but, but just heavy, tired, exhausted, drifting, thin, sad, lonely, and tired, and done. Uh, and so uh, it's no wonder we feel that way Be because it feels like we have the weight of the world on our shoulders right now uh, and, and we don't see an end in sight. And so Pastor Matt has walked us through in the past several months a lot of the hard things, uh, things like uh, anxiety and depression, politics and current events. Uh, he's going to launch a new series next week we're, we're excited about called Living in an Age of Rage, which we just feel that in our bones, right? Uh, and, and I know that's going to be a super helpful series. And, and so there's a time for us to sit in hard places. There's a time for us to, uh, to lament and, and to share and to bear one another's burdens. But there's also a time to, to lift our heads uh, and to look up and to see around us. And, and as I was praying this week about what the Lord would have us for us this morning, I, I felt like he said he wants to restore our joy this morning. He wants to restore our joy. He wants, to, he wants us to breathe deeply of his grace. Uh, he wants us to renew our confidence in his goodness. Uh, and, and he wants us to be assured of his delight in us. And, 
And then lastly, that he wants us to believe that our Heavenly Father is up to something good in the middle of all the hard things. And so before I get into what inexpressible joy is, which like, that's just a perfect picture. That's what inexpressible joy is. Uh, but before I get into what it is, I want to be clear about what it's not. And, and it's not just fake smiles, right? It's not just, well, bless God, I'm not where I want to be, but I'm not where I could be, right? It, it, it's not fake it till you make it. Uh, it. It's not the power of positivity or the secret of attraction. This is digging deep into the well of our souls uh, to, to pull out from within us and to remind ourselves of the greatness of our God, the promises of our God. And so this morning, we're going to jump into the book of First Peter, uh, which you can guess by the name that it was written by a guy named Peter. And Peter is one of Jesus' disciples, his closest followers, his top three friends. And uh, we, we all love Peter because Peter is a knucklehead who talks too much. He gets himself into trouble with his mouth. Uh, he, 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 he puts himself in situations uh, that are relatable. And so, you know, Peter's the guy, he talked himself into being able to walk on water with Jesus. He jumped out of the boat and, and did that. Um, you know, Peter's the guy that uh, Jesus rebuked and called him Satan for trying to talk him in, into uh, abandoning his mission. Uh, Peter's the guy who used his mouth to deny Jesus. Uh, and Peter's also the guy who, who preached the first outdoor revival service. And so uh, Peter's words opened doors and, and got him in trouble. And I can relate to that because I want to use my words uh, to build up and to encourage. Um, but man, I just say stupid things all the time. In fact, just this past week, uh, I was doing a wedding rehearsal um, where we were practicing the different pieces uh, of the marriage ceremony. And uh, we were talking about where the bagpipe player would play. And yes, a bagpipe player. There, there were no uh, plastic spoons or paper plates at this wedding. It was beautiful and awesome. Uh, but, you know... The, the mother-in-law, uh, who's a dear friend, a lifelong friend of mine, we were talking about when the bagpipe player would play and for how long. And, and I said, well, it's going to take about five minutes for the ladies to walk from where they're coming from and, and to get into place, which would have been enough. But then I slid in, and five minutes is about as long as people enjoy bagpipe music anyway. Yeah. In that moment, I could tell she did not find that as funny as I did. I was just trying to be silly. I was just trying to bring some levity. Um, but in that moment, my lack of awareness caused deep hurt to my friend. Uh, and my mouth got me in trouble. Now, for the record, the bagpipe music was beautiful. Uh, it was epic. It was awesome. I wanted more bagpipe music, not less, right? If you need a guy, I know a guy. Uh, and so I share all that today to say, well, one, I'm an idiot. But, but secondly, uh, that in our current American context, a lot of the carnage, a lot of the hurt uh, is fueled by, it's rooted by a war of our words. And we're so free with our opinions. We're so certain of our right positions. Uh, we're so staked in that we forget that the power of life is in the tongue. The power of life and death is in our tongue. And it's a real struggle for me. If you can believe it, I have a second story from just the week before. Even better, I'll save it for another time. Uh, but just to say that this is a struggle for me. Back to 1 Peter. Peter opens the book of 1 Peter addressing his audience, uh, and he says this, to God's chosen people scattered around these different uh, provinces of Asia Minor, which is like modern-day Turkey. Uh, and, and so the context of what's happening is this is about 60 AD, and uh, the Emperor Nero is beginning a reign of terror against Christians that's going to go on uh, for some time. That uh, This guy makes ISIS look friendly. Uh, cities, whole cities, towns, people, uh, homes were being burned. It was a dangerous time to be a Christian. And so the Christian Jews and the new believers, the Gentiles, they were, they were spreading out all over the known world. They were fleeing Rome away from this persecution. They were scattered. And, and there's uh, some similarity between that reality and, and the current reality of the church, that it's been a season where we've been unable to gather physically together. Uh, we've been spread out to our little parts of the world, and, and we're living in, in smaller clusters right now. But that's where the comparison ends, because it, it really isn't reasonable to say that what we're experiencing in the church right now is persecution. That sure, there's, it's been a hard season. Some churches have, have experienced more pressure than others. Uh, but it's really unfair to our friends around the world who are experiencing real danger and death and destruction. 
uh, to call this uh, political situation persecution. The Bible really, it doesn't speak to this idea of politically uh, delivered religious liberty. Uh, that, that this idea of peaceful protest and, and um, class action lawsuits against the government, that's all a very new concept. There, there's nothing like that at the time of the scriptures. And so uh, there is freedom in Christ, but it, it comes from a king and a kingdom, not from a government. But the church here in First Peter, it's experiencing real persecution. Uh, Peter's going to suggest that it's actually a good thing, that the church has actually uh, thrived under pressure. That historically, the church launched out of the execution uh, of our primary central figure. That's Jesus, right? And then for hundreds of years, experienced persecution that goes on to this day. And in fact, did you know that today, in, in our modern age, an average of 11 people are martyred every day for their faith? That, that yesterday, today, probably tomorrow, an average of 11 people every day leave this world um, because they refuse to renounce Jesus, do you know more than 100 churches are destroyed, burnt, torn down, uh, taken out? 100 churches a day in this modern world uh, because of Jesus. And so with all of that happening, you would think, man, it's a tough time. And yet the good news of Jesus, the gospel, it cannot be stopped. And so right now all over the world, the church in India, in China, in the Middle East, it's exploding despite this persecution and despite this pushback. Uh, God is doing great things through his scattered church. And so if you're interested in learning more about modern persecution, I'd encourage you to check out Voice of the Martyrs. Their website's just persecution.org. But to get us back into the passage, uh, he starts out with verse 3, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, in his great mercy, he has given us new birth and a living hope through the resurrection of the dead of our Lord Jesus Christ. And Peter says praise, and when he says praise, I see like hand emojis, right? And you can't do this without lifting your head, without, without lifting up and, and seeing uh, around you. And it's like he's saying, hey guys, I, I know it's been tough, but lift your eyes. Uh, see what God is doing. Praise be to God. Why praise God? Uh, because he's given us new birth in Christ, right? He's given us a living hope in Jesus. And we pay attention to that verb that he has given us this new life. Uh, we didn't earn it. We didn't deserve it. We didn't faith it. We didn't win the geographical lottery of being born into a family that took us to church. It is a gift from God. He has given us new birth into a living hope. Why living? Well, because Jesus is living, that he's alive, that the tomb is empty, that he uh, conquered hell and death in the grave, and that no grave could hold him down. And so my opening encouragement to us this morning uh, is that if we want to find joy, uh, we, we, then we need to, when things look uncertain, we need to know what is certain, right? When there's so much unknown, we need to celebrate what is known. And what is known is that Jesus saved you, that Jesus uh, gave you what you couldn't earn. And in this passage, we see this past, present, and future saving that Jesus is doing, that God chose us from the beginning is what it says. And this is like a profound mystery we don't have time to get into, but it's like parents who decide to have a child, decide to bring a baby into the world, right? And that God made you and chose you and designed you with a purpose, that he gave you a new life. That's the present, right? That, that, that we are being transformed uh, to become more like Jesus. And then say, lastly, um, that we have this future living hope, that, that there is coming a time, a reality, uh, when we will have life that will go on forever in the presence of God. And so uh, we can find encouragement when we don't know all the details. What we do know is that God saved us, that he is changing us, and he will deliver us to an amazing future, free of the pain and frustration and uncertainty of this world. We continue verse 4. Um, it says, and into an inheritance that will never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, through, uh, who through faith are shielded by the power of God until the coming of salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. And so these verses, they're, again, they're full of profound truth. But what I want to pull out of there is, again, this idea of past, present, and future action by God. 
that again, we see the now and the not yet, the new life here and the eternal life that is to come. And so as children of our Heavenly Father, we have an inheritance, it says, uh, a promised inheritance. And it's not like an earthly inheritance that, that's stuck in a bank account and can be spent and, and can disappear, right? We all know families who have passed down great wealth, um, but a, a prolonged illness or a failed business zapped millions of dollars. That's not what this kind of inheritance is. It, it's, it says it's kept in heaven and our God never goes bankrupt. It says it will never spoil or perish or fade. I think this crisis, it, it's shown us uh, what really matters, that what glitters isn't always gold, and that what's here today can be gone tomorrow. Uh, we, we, we know people who were very secure, uh, but in a matter of weeks, their, their security was taken out, and we're months now into this crisis. Uh, people who weren't wealthy but didn't struggle now find themselves receiving the kind of care uh, and assistance that they were used to giving. Uh, this pandemic, it's reminded us of the value and the importance of relationships, uh, of the fragility of life, of the reality that, that no one outruns death. Uh, not the young, not the wealthy, not the famous. We all have to bank our lives on something that's greater than what we can see, than what we can achieve and what, can, what we can accumulate. We have to put our hope in the living hope of Jesus, who conquered hell and death and the grave. He says, this inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power. And I want to stop and I want to talk to my friends who are followers of Jesus. You know, maybe, maybe you grew up in church. You went to VBS. You did the mission trip thing. You got baptized. You know, you, you've been in the church. You give and you serve. Uh, you might be 20, 40, 60 years old, but you don't remember a time in your life where you felt this shaken, where you feel like at your core, um, you have doubts and fears that you don't know what to do with. You know, the constant bad news, the, the politics of everything and anything, uh, the, the, the hypocrisy and the duplicity of the church and the people who call themselves Christians your feelings of failure and disappointment, your, your mental health pushed to the brink uh, where you feel like you can't possibly have those kind of thoughts and be a follower of Jesus. I, I wanna look at you and I wanna be really clear that doubting faith is not dead faith. That remember the beginning of this passage, you were given your salvation and peace with God. You didn't earn it. You didn't deserve it. You can't, you can't unfaith it away. Jesus said it this way in John 10. He said, my sheep know my voice and they follow me. I give them eternal life. They will never perish. No one will snatch them from my hands. Uh, my father who has given them to me is greater than all. And he again says, no one will snatch them from my father's hands. So guys, Hold on to Jesus. Hold on to Jesus. He is holding on to you this morning. No failure, no thought, uh, no action, no addiction, no person, no demon, no devil can snatch you from the hands of Jesus. And so if you believe that this morning and you need to hear that just in the chat, just say it, Jesus is holding me. It continues, verse six. Uh, in this you, were great, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, you may have to, had to suffer grief and all kinds of trials. It, it says you greatly rejoice, right? To rejoice means uh, to, to show joy, like to, to tell your face uh, what your mind and your heart knows, to lift your head. It says, though now for a little while, you will experience suffering. And Peter doesn't tell them this, but this little while is going to go on for another 250 years until around the year 313 when Constantine shows up. Uh, and, and so they're going to experience great suffering. And we say this at South Point all the time, that, that we tell you the truth here, that anyone who says uh, that following Jesus is, is, a, is a path uh, to pleasure and ease uh, and uh, wealth is lying to you or hasn't read the Bible or both. And anyone that would cherry pick a verse that's intended for a specific person or situation, but ignore entire books of the Bible isn't for you. They're not telling you the truth because Jesus said, you will have trouble. 
you will suffer. Uh, and so again, the church is built on the execution of Jesus. The church was built on the execution of the followers of Jesus, like Peter, who 20 years from the time he wrote this book would be executed. But here's the great news. Joy and suffering are not mutually exclusive. Uh, you can experience joy and suffering at the same time. Uh, a couple weeks ago, I went and visited my friend Brenda. And Brenda, if you're watching, we're praying with you and for you and your family. Uh, and, and I went and visited Brenda, who's in the late stages of cancer. And, you know, she, uh, she's nearing the finish line of her faith. She's about to experience the promises that are talked about in this passage. And she has every right uh, to ask, why is God allowing this to happen to her? Why is she not gonna be able to, to experience being a grandmother? Why isn't she gonna be able to retire and enjoy that, that season with her husband? But Brenda, she's so full of joy. Uh, again, not, not fake smiles, but genuine Holy Spirit given joy. Uh, that, that she exudes joy as she talks about how proud of her daughters she is, uh, about what a great life she's lived. Uh, she exudes joy as she talks about the privilege of being a part of a church like South Point that's multi-ethnic and that, uh, that talks about hard things and, and wants all people to live in relationship with God and with each other. See, Brenda's has discovered the secret that you can have joy and suffering. And, and if, you experience, if you expect to experience one or the other, you're always going to be disappointed and confused. They're not opposite sides. They, they run together, and you can experience suffering and joy. Verse 7, these trials have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus is revealed. Friends, trials, trials produce and prove faith. Are there other things that produce faith? Absolutely, right? A well-timed, well-explained truth, that can produce faith. Beauty, it produces faith. Worship produces faith. Uh, but, but Peter tells us that pain, that trials, that suffering, that's what proves our faith. That's what refines and hardens uh, and gives durability and perseverance to our faith. It says that this uh, that this is worth greater, uh, it's of greater worth than gold. So whatever we'd rather be experiencing right now, whatever pleasure or, or entertainment, whatever financial security, whatever relationship status, uh, whatever honor or fame or power we, we wish we had, Jesus is better, right? Jesus, just say that in the chat. Jesus is better. Everything else fades. Cars break, houses you know, decay, Someone else will do our job. Uh, we will never be fully satisfied in another person. We'll never be completed by somebody else. Whatever it is that we're hoping for, Jesus is better. And so these trials, uh, he says that they may, uh, uh, that these trials happen that we may result in praise and glory and honor when Christ is revealed. And so he's speaking here of the, of the end of time when Jesus comes back, but I also think He's saying that Christ is revealed in our response, that Christ is revealed in our response to pain and trials. And so I have to ask myself, does my response reveal Christ? Does, does my response produce praise and glory and honor? So I'm all for speaking out against injustice. Uh, I'm all for fighting for a cause you believe in. But, but I really believe this, that, that most of our words at this point are uh, most of, most of the words that we say with our tongue or that we write with our thumbs, they're just noise. We're just shouting into the wind. That as our family and our friends are looking to us who follow Jesus to have some kind of hope, some kind of joy, some kind of answer for this season, we're just joining in with the chorus of noise. We're just adding to the hateful rhetoric of the rest of the world. And instead of praise and honor and glory, uh, we're just giving more fear and division and brokenness. Verse 8, though you have seen him, I'm sorry, though you have not seen him, this is Jesus, though you have not seen Jesus, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him, and you're filled with inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation 
of your souls. Uh, and so this verse is really, this is the whole inspiration for the message that when I began to pray around this idea of joy, uh, I was reminded of a song that we sang growing up, that he will fill you up with his glorious joy, his exalted, inexpressible joy. And it comes from this verse, verse eight. He says, though you have not seen him, and I don't know about you, but does it ever, does it ever feel like you haven't seen Jesus in a while? Like, you know that feeling in the movie where it gets real dark and, and it looks like uh, the bad guys are winning and the good guys are barely holding on and, and the hero is missing? That's kind of like what life is, is always like, but especially in this season. That, that the scripture tells us there's a war in the heavenlies and that there are real casualties around us. That's the brokenness and bustedness of the world we see around us is the reality of what's going on uh, in the physical and in the spiritual and so we know that in the end, Jesus wins. But in the meantime, there's real hurt and real pain and real death. And so if you've ever looked around and wondered, where is God? You're not alone. Like a lot of us feel that. And so of course you haven't seen Jesus physically, but but it, sometimes it feels like he's totally missing in action. And you think, hey, Jesus, like if you were looking for a time to show up uh, and, and win the day, now would be a great time, right? Like, fix it, Jesus. And so while we want to get back, uh, we want Jesus to swoop in and, and get everything back to the way that it should be, uh, our lives of, uh, of really ease and convenience, there's a promise here for us in this season while it's hard. And the promise is this. Uh, you love him even though you haven't seen him. And here's the promise. You are filled with inexpressible and glorious joy inexpressible, it's an interesting word choice here because like, it's like there's no word for it. You can't even describe it. It's so great. Uh, think about the best thing you've ever eaten. I don't know if it's the best thing I've ever eaten, but a couple weeks ago, I had this uh, French toast, chicken and French toast. It's kind of like chicken and waffles uh, in Asheville. And man, it was so, it was like slap the table good. I had to like not make eye contact with my friend. It was a spiritual moment. It was like unbelievably no words for it good. Or, or maybe you've been hanging out with friends before uh, and, and somebody starts laughing and then you start laughing and then everybody's laughing and, and it's like uh, the, the really hard gut laugh where no noise is coming out. There's just tears coming out of your face and you're just laughing so hard. And that's just, that's a glimpse. That's a glimpse of divine delight. That's a, that's a glimpse, a peek into what this inexpressible from the Spirit of God, joy looks like, where there are no words to describe it. Again, this isn't uh, the same as happiness. This is deeply felt from the heart, from, uh, from the soul, Holy Spirit-inspired joy, glorious joy, weird in all the right ways joy, contagious, spread it to other people, joy. And so again, uh, I just wanna say, sign me up for that. But the problem is it doesn't just happen. We have to choose this joy, right? It says, even though you haven't seen him, you love him. There's a choice there where we choose this joy. Uh, and so I just wanna leave us with three, uh, three paths to choose joy. And the first is this, uh, is to choose a posture of humility. To choose a posture of humility. Uh, and the statement that I, that I have for this is that it's hard to enjoy people when I think I'm better than them. I'm going to let that sit for a minute, right? It's hard to enjoy people when I think I'm better than them. Comparison is the thief of joy, but I think sometimes the comparison is that I think I'm better than other people. Uh, I came across this devotion about pride and humility, and at the end of it, it gives you a questionnaire of more than 40 questions that kind of checks out, uh, you know, how's your pride doing? And, and by default then, uh, how's your humility doing? And, and so maybe you're like me, you're like, man, I'm the most humble person in the world. Like they should give an award for humble people and I would be that humble person, right? Uh, and, and so here's just five examples to get you started and kind of give you a heart check. You ready? In your heart of hearts, do you see yourself as better than others because of who you are? Oh, it's uncomfortable. All right. Do you think yourself 
somewhat superior because of what you have. Hmm. Do you view yourself as intellectually superior to others? When you're with other people, do you always seem to talk about yourself? Always calling the subject back to yourself, mentioning yourself as an example, always talking about your own interests, your own experiences. Hmm. Do you give your opinion even though others haven't asked for it? I mean, isn't that what like all of social media is, right? And lastly, bonus question. Uh, do you feel hurt when others are looked at in greater admiration than you? Or when others are complimented for qualities that you don't have or that you struggle with? Okay, maybe I'm not so humble after all. I, I, I feel attacked, I'm gonna be honest, right? Uh, in all seriousness, I, I think the internet it, it, it really feeds into this belief. We get an unrealistic perception of what we have to offer the world. And so you might be one of these things, but you're probably not a medical doctor, a constitutional scholar, a teacher, and a police officer. And so we have to pause and ask the question by choosing a, a position of humility, maybe ask ourselves, before I say whatever I'm about to say, in the office, at the dinner table, on social media, can I ask the question, is it possible I'm wrong? Or to look at it another way, is it possible we're both right? Is it possible there can be two existing truths? Or is it possible that part of my subpoints are correct and part of their subpoints are correct? And that despite the vote for Jesus bumper stickers, Jesus isn't running for office and so there is no perfect solution, right? Choose humility. Ask, is it possible that somebody else knows something I don't know? Secondly, uh, spur, don't stir. Uh, some of us are really, some of us are really good at stirring things up. Uh, the closer you are to someone, the the faster you can push their buttons and, and really uh, escalate their their emotions. And in this political and cultural moment, it, it doesn't take much, right? It doesn't take much to push people back into their sides, uh, to build their walls back up and to not engage. And so we've, we've lost the ability uh, to, to have reasonable dialogue. And so uh, social media just becomes reposting memes and regurgitating the talking points of, of whatever our preferred news outlet is. And, and, and we've really missed each other. Uh, but I have to ask, is there a better way? Hebrews 10 says it this way. He says, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he, that's God, is pr who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we can spur one another on, spur one another on towards love and good deeds. And so it's easy to stir up irritation. It's easy to, to stir up feelings and division, uh, but it takes thoughtful consideration to ask, how can I spur my friends on towards love and good deeds, even if I disagree with them? Uh, now, if you're friends with me on Facebook, you know, I, I don't mind a brisk dialogue. My, my bio on Facebook is, uh, opinions are mine, don't blame my wife or my church, okay? So, you know, I'm not against meaningful discussion and change. Uh, but I have to ask, and I have to ask you and I have to ask myself, do you spend more time stirring or spurring? Stirring, st you know, stirring debate, stirring uh, political positions, theological positions, whatever it might be? Or do I spend more time spurring my friends on towards love and good deeds? And then lastly, uh, keep the end in mind, which we've been saying a lot lately here. And, and I just, I like the way that this rounds out in verse nine uh, of our passage today. It says, you know, you're filled with inexpressible and glorious joy because you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. And so Peter wraps up the passage uh, or this part of the passage by reminding us that the pain, the struggle, the suffering, it, it leads to a result. It's going somewhere. And that result is both here and now and later. That ultimately it leads to the salvation of our souls that lasts forever. And so this life isn't all there is. And, and the hard times remind us uh, to look up and to see that there is more to this life than what we can see in this present moment. There will come a day where we will stand before a holy God. And because of Jesus, if we've said yes to him, uh, we don't have to be afraid or uncertain. 
And so that doesn't mean that we just like persevere and trudge through and kind of look forward to death in this weird and dark way. Uh, no, it means that we, we live in such a way that it's clear that this world is not our home, that we are living for a kingdom beyond this life, beyond this current reality. And so as we wrap up, I want to take a minute and recognize that, that for the last 20, 30 minutes, we've been talking about ideas uh, and truths that apply if you've said yes to Jesus. And so maybe you've been tracking along, but you're not 100% sure what that means. And so briefly, what it means uh, to, to trust Jesus as Lord and Savior, it's not the same as saying, I, I don't want to die and go to hell. And it's not even the same as saying, hey, I want to say yes to Jesus so I can have some of this joy that you're talking about, right? It's actually the opposite of that. It's saying, it's recognizing your own inability. It's saying, uh, I don't have what it takes to create meaning and purpose and significance uh, on my own. I don't have a way to avoid suffering and to make up for, for the things and the ways that I've added to the bustedness and brokenness of the world. You know, we talked about the spiritual war before, and, and at one point we've chosen the wrong side, and, and we've, again, we've added to the hurt instead of uh, the healing. And, and so um, that we've, we've done and said things that separate us from God. Uh, but we go back to the beginning of the passage where it says, thanks be to God, uh, to Jesus, who, who gave us new life and living hope. And, and so this is a free gift that's offered to all of us uh, to receive the, the living hope that comes through Jesus. God is inviting you today into a new life, uh, and into a hope that, that helps you see beyond what you can see now. We can't earn it. We can't buy it. Uh, we can't faith it. We simply surrender into the arms of our Heavenly Father. And I would love to give you the opportunity to do that this morning. And the promise is this. Good news. You're going to suffer. Sorry, like there's just, there's just no two ways about it. In fact, you might even suffer more. But... With that comes this promise uh, that through the Spirit of God, we will receive this supernatural joy uh, that transcends what's going on and that can never be snuffed out. And so if you're already a follower of Jesus, I wanna encourage you to, to kind of recommit yourself, renew your commitment and your dependency on Jesus to declare that he is the source of glorious, inexpressible joy and to kind of repent and turn away uh, from some of the things that, that, that we have turned to for pleasure and distraction. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much uh, that, that you give us the gift of new life, uh, that, that you are our living hope, that Jesus is not on the, on the cross, he's not in a tomb, uh, but he is raised to new life, and that you invite us uh, into that reality. And because we say yes to Jesus, uh, we are given the Holy Spirit who gives us joy, unspeakable, inexpressible, never-ending, deep wells of joy uh, that help us to navigate the hard seasons of life. And so I pray for my friends uh, that in their own language, in their own word, that, that they would uh, reach out to you and say, God, I recognize uh, that, that I have said and done things that, that displease you, that add to the brokenness of the world, and I receive this gift, and I believe uh, that you are, you are saving me in this moment uh, and that you will deliver on your promise of eternal life and that there will be a time free of pain and hurt. And for my friends who, who are followers of Jesus, I pray we would recommit ourselves uh, and depend on the finished work of Jesus and to turn back uh, to seeing you as the source and we would lay down uh, the things that are, that are sucking our souls dry and that are pushing us to the edge. I believe, God, you're pulling us back this morning uh, as we trust you, God. Give us joy, give us hope, give us freedom. In Jesus' name, amen.